The race to exploit vast natural resources has commenced in one of the world's most important larders. The Earth's most vulnerable ecosystem is under threat from oil spills, dying fish and global warming. As the ice melts, many people are being tempted to engage in predatory activities in the Arctic. In an ocean where the fish resources have already been used up, I've decided that effective at midnight tonight, there will be a moratorium and harvesting of northern cod. Let me do it. He's done nothing but S-H-I-T to his... Is predatory activity about to restart? In the hunt for valuable resources, we've engaged in the exploitation of the vulnerable territory of the Arctic. Fish stocks are under threat from increasing global consumption and today's efficient fishing methods. This could result in fatal consequences for the environment in the northernmost part of the world. Developments have rapidly enabled us to deplete fish stocks burn up our last drops of oil and wipe out the planet's resources simply by pressing a button. For generations, we've been turning to the Arctic seas for our food, a larder that is essential for our existence. Er det en ting som, som er helt sikkert, så er det jo at vi trenger mat som er høstet på en bærekraftig måte. Og det er klart at fiskeriressursene i nordområdene her er ekstremt viktig for å forsyne verdens befolkning med denne type mat. Og, og, og vil være veldig, veldig alvorlig. Det vil være mange flere mennesker som rett og slett vil sulte hvis ikke vi kan høste av disse ressursene. Some people have said, you know, with the technology, we could take every fish in the ocean. Now, I'm not quite sure that's true. It's, you know, at least one might get away. But the point is made that we, can, we could do this. It's clear that we are in stand to tømme the Arctic havene for the rest of the torsken. We have tømt it for the old, stor whale-artene, Grønlandsval and Nordkapper. We have ødelagt many other fiskebestander. Uh, og vi har ødelagt uh, verdens største torskebestand uh, på The Grand Banks. Predatory activities directed at Arctic resources could have an impact on us all, something already experienced by coastal fishermen in Newfoundland off the eastern coast of Canada. Bernard Martin has witnessed major changes in the Arctic ecosystem due to his close relationship with marine resources. I started fishing in the early uh, 1970s, and uh, I've fished pretty much my whole adult lifetime. It's been mostly my only uh, occupation. It's, it's part of my life. It's uh, what defines me as a person. I'm a fisherman, and uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's very important to me. In the morning, as the sun comes up, it's it's very special. Yeah, there's not too many jobs like it, I don't think. <laughs> Ever since Bernard first started fishing, he's been witnessing predatory activities aimed at cod stocks. The first uh, thing I learned was that uh, there was a huge threat to the, uh, to the health of our cod fishery. He's made his mark by becoming involved in a commitment to stop overfishing. I guess from an environmental conservation perspective, I, I started to get involved with organizations that were uh, trying to uh, bring some attention to the to the crisis in the fishery, to overfishing in general, and you know to habitat uh, 
destruction and, and all that. I became even more involved and I started doing uh, speaking tours. Through his involvement and meetings with politicians, Bernard has put across his message about the need for moderation in the hunt for resources. I guess we have to, uh, to keep it in, in, the, in the backs of our minds that uh, as a species and we have the technology and the power and the, the will, whatever it is, to, uh, to destroy anything on, on the planet. It's been maintained in several quarters that we're in the process of depleting fish stocks in the Arctic. Fishing operations are now so efficient, due to modern technology, that the cod stocks in the Barents Sea could be wiped out. We stand a little in a slur, and then it's completely impossible to say it, all of a sudden. But it's a lot. The captain is looking for the perfect place to deploy his seine net. Now I'm just waiting for a flight to go. Okay. We'll have to do this job here now, we'll have to do it. If it's deployed in the wrong place, he could risk losing several thousand dollars. Is it possible for today's trawlers to threaten what are probably the most important fishing stocks in the world and to empty the sea of fish? This is what happened in the Arctic ecosystem in the sea off Newfoundland. One of our most important sources of food, fish, rich in protein, comes from this area. If you go back to the days of sail and the days of small boats not powered by engines, you have a fishery which depends a lot on the bravery of people, you know, the, the willingness to go out in, in difficult weather and the ability to understand uh, the environment, to, to understand when it's safe and when it's not safe and when they're going to be fish and when there isn't going to be fish. These cod stocks were so vast that fishermen from all over Europe made the long journey to these fishing banks in the northwest. All of the early fishing would have been with, with uh, a hook and line. Some, some baited, some not. I mean, cod are so voracious at certain times of year, they're so hungry that they, you don't even need bait. I mean, you, all you need is, is something shiny in the water with, with a hook. It gives you some idea of the, of the tremendous abundance of the fish that was there. You know, they would, they would have no problem catching, you know, cat, catching that much. Hundreds of thousands of tons, all caught one by one. <laughs> After the Second World War, the fishing industry experienced a technological revolution. The heroic courage of fishermen was replaced by equipment designed to improve catch efficiency. Bringing trawlers here was initially thought to be uneconomical, but all, all of that changed after the Second World War. Some of the other inventions that came were the, the, uh, the botter filleting machine. Freezing is another one of the technologies that came along. When echo sounders came, you can go and find every fish in the ocean. You can find every one. So all of a sudden, you can literally clean out a whole stock, fillet it and freeze it with very little labor relative to what happened before. So what it meant was that instead of uh, you taking all season and all of the communities around Newfoundland to catch 200,000 tons, they eventually, given this technology, could catch a million tons in a couple of months. It just completely upped the ante in terms of, of what was possible. Using current technology, we could virtually suck up all the species of fish in the sea. If we are to harvest fish from the ocean sustainably, we have to control ourselves. We cannot have unfettered use of all technology or we will kill everything in the ocean. But fish stocks are not just being threatened by efficiency on the conveyor belt. 
they could also be hit by changes in temperature. Fra begynnelsen av 1990-tallet så har vi altså hatt eventyrlig god produksjon av Barentshavtorsken på grunn av de høye temperaturene, og det har fortsatt å øke helt fram til første halvdel av dette tiåret. Og vi må kunne si at Barentshavtorsken i dag er historisk høy. Many scientists say that the temperature in the Barents Sea will drop during the next few years. How would this affect cod stocks? Når temperaturen går ned, så reduseres planktonproduktiviteten. Og opprettholder man da et like høyt fiskepress som man hadde under disse gode årene, så blir det for mye for den bestanden. Due to the fact that cod stocks in the Barents Sea have now climbed to record high levels, quotas for 2009 have been increased by 100,000 tons for 2010. That means an increase of around 20 percent. Selv om vi har en høy bestand, så må vi være veldig varsomme med fisketrykket når produktiviteten i planktonet går ned. If the scientists are right about the temperature in the sea dropping, then cod stocks in the Barents Sea will soon be affected. Dersom det blir kaldere, så reduseres planktonproduksjonen i Barentshavet omtrent fra det ene året til det andre. Resultatet er ganske omgående reduksjon i eggproduksjonen for den fiskebestanden, og vi får med en gang mye dårligere rekruttering. Faren er at naturlige endringer og nye miljøpåvirkninger, først og fremst klimaendring, dessuten miljøgiftproblematikken og andre biologiske endringer som skjer i havet, kan føre til en situasjon hvor dagens forvaltningsregime ikke er godt nok til å reagere på endringer som skjer i naturen. The first people to notice that cod stocks were changing were the coastal fishermen when, more than 20 years ago, they issued warnings about stocks facing a crisis. People knew that draggers were becoming a bigger and bigger part of the fishery and that they had this uh, technology and this power to do a lot of uh, damage to the stocks and also to the ocean environment, to bottom environment. So this, uh, it, there was, it was always this, this knowledge was in the back of people's minds and it, uh, it was, it was kind of scary. They were affected by their fear of stocks collapsing. But this is our resource, uh, a resource that made us what we are, that's sustained us for hundreds of years, and now it's uh, threatened by the foreign fleets, the, the, uh, the factory freezer trawlers and the, the big draggers from, mostly from Europe, from the Soviet Union. When people saw that the, uh, the, the stocks were getting uh, smaller and smaller, and uh, the numbers were, were fewer and fewer, and also the, uh, the fish was coming in short later and later in the season, uh, people reacted. I guess it's a typical human reaction. You just try harder. They were powerless as they tried in vain to change developments. There was a lot of frustration because we certainly, uh, as, as a community and as also as a province, and all the inshore communities were complaining about uh, what was happening, that the fish were getting scarcer and scarcer, and it seemed that nobody was listening. A disaster was in the process of occurring. It was just massive overfishing that started after the Second World War. And after that, things became very unsustainable very, very quickly. Tragedy was unavoidable. Former Canadian Fisheries Minister John Crosby was forced to make a very unpopular decision. It was a constant crisis in the fishery, and it was getting worse and worse. And what finally um, made it uh, 
certain that we had to close the cod fishery was the fact that uh, the scientists st were reducing their estimates of what a total allowable catch was permissible. The inshore fishermen were starting to realize this is not working. The cod are not growing the way we expected. We better start to cut back. But by then, it was too late. The machinery was in place, the industry was in place, the, the politicians were faced with the fact that the science was telling them that far too many fish were being killed, the quotas were far too high, and what were they gonna do? I certainly can remember that day. We need to reduce catches to a minimum to protect the dangerously low spawning stock, the lowest level since records began. And allow fast I was having a press conference in this hotel and uh, that day, July 2nd, and so the hotel was full and uh, had been full of uh, fishermen in particular all day. I'm aware of the serious problem they many had fisheries me face. in one room making the announcement. Others had to go to a second room, another separate room, and watch on television the announcement. For all of those reasons, and to safeguard the northern cod as a species, I've decided that effective at midnight tonight, there will be a moratorium and harvesting of northern cod. And this got them very angry. He should appear before us, the fishermen! I ain't stupid! Couldn't blame them, the fishermen, but, but in particular, uh, they were in a bad mood anyway and worried about their future. We should go down and knock on that door. And here is this huge thumping sounds, right, of the fishermen hurling themselves against the door, trying to get in, into the room. Not on. Six generations down the line passed out, and he's done nothing but S-H-I-T to us. After the press conference was over, the police felt I was in danger, and so I had to be escorted out of this hotel with the police on either side of me. What are you doing? Why get off of me, you're retarded! That was the end. The summer of 1992 was probably the first summer in 500 years when there was no fishery in coastal Newfoundland. It was like somebody threw a switch. Busy days at the fishing factory are now a thing of the past. Today they stand as monuments to how human predatory activities aimed at resources can backfire. The whole basis of sustainable fisheries is to take no more than what that stock can replace each year. And we utterly failed here in our waters to live by that simple rule. 30,000 coastal fishermen lost their jobs, and the world's most abundant cod stocks were almost wiped out. The inshore fishermen, they were the ones, and the fishing communities in which they lived all around the island were the, the people who paid the biggest price uh, for, for this calamity, which really took 40 years to, uh, to bring about. There was no income, the fishery was shut down. What are we gonna do for a living? How are we gonna you know, pay our bills and feed our families and make our mortgage payments and what, you know, whatever, right? 18 years after fishing operations were stopped by the authorities, cod stocks have still not recovered enough to reach the sort of levels that would enable coastal fishermen to resume their activities. It may take um, another 10, 15, 20 years, who knows, before the stocks are are even close to what they were, you know, historically, let's say back in the early uh, 1960s. You can look to us, look to Canada as an example of, of how not to manage your fishery. It's a huge uh, tragedy and uh, it should never have happened. The island developed because of cod, people settled here because of cod. Uh, I think wars were fought over, over, over the cod resource. 
One war over resources resulted in amendments to the law of the sea. Germany and Britain had long been engaged in fishing activities in the sea off Iceland. In 1958, Iceland declared an expansion of its fisheries zone to an outer limit of 12 nautical miles, despite protests from Britain. However, this was accepted without any major conflicts occurring. But in the 1970s, Iceland extended its claim. So in the early 1970s, uh, they widened uh, the 12 mile limit to a 50 nautical mile limit. After only two years, the Icelanders realized that 50 miles was not enough either. So um, they widened uh, their economic zone to 200 nautical miles. A full-scale conflict developed between these two NATO allies. Can you tell me, have you seen any sign of the Icelandic gunboats, over? Several incidents involving the Icelandic Navy and British trawlers supported by Royal Naval vessels created discord within NATO. It was only when Iceland threatened to close the US NATO base in Keflavik that Iceland managed to force through its extended economic zone. I utgangspunktet så er jo historien om en økonomisk zone et viktig kapitel i menneskenes historie og forvaltning av havene. Og det at kyststatene har 200 nautiske mil automatisk, og så må de strekke grenser der hvor de overlapper, det har jo lagt et grunnlag for kyststatkontroll med ressursene som er helt avgjørende. But what's happening outside the 200 nautical mile limit? We have a kind of peculiar situation here on the, on the, the Grand Banks because uh, it, it, it extends, the bank itself extends so far uh, from the shore that, that a portion of it is uh, outside the 200 mile limit in international waters. We normally call this the nose and the tail of the bank for the, uh, the northern area and the, and the southern area that are, that are outside. We spent years in frustration trying to get to the North Atlantic Fisheries Organization, which controls the area outside 200 mile economic zone, to take action. And uh, they ignored us and they ignored our protestations. A large international fleet has continued fishing just outside Canadian territory in the middle of an area inhabited by large quantities of fish that have survived the 1992 collapse in cod stocks. This provoked the Canadian authorities who decided in 1995 to mark their displeasure by resorting to military force. It has systematically destroyed stock after stock after stock and Canada is determined that it will not let this fleet destroy this stock. The Canadian Coast Guard arrested a Spanish trawler, the Estai, which was outside Canadian jurisdiction. By using water cannon and firing a .50 caliber machine gun, they managed to stop the Estai and escort her to the quay in St. John's. It's hard to see how things have improved very much in international waters. And this is a world problem and is going to have to be dealt with. In the coming century, this is going to be, I think, one of the major, major international concerns. Uh, you know, squabbles over resources have always driven many of the political agendas in the world, and this is, this is going to be one for the 21st century. The Estai case resulted in major demonstrations in Canada and Spain. The European Union subjected Canada to heavy diplomatic pressure because Canada had arrested the Estai in international waters. Je considère tout ça un acte de piraterie organisé. The Canadian authorities responded by displaying illegal catch equipment from the Estai at a press conference in New York. Canada has been the most reluctant of nations to assert its own self-interest. The question now is not why are we doing it today, the question is why has it taken us so long? Despite EU accusations of piracy, Canada also received support for having drawn attention to fisheries problems in international waters. I would the Minister in fact make it abundantly clear that we are well aware that Spanish fishermen have illegally 
destroyed fishing grounds in many other areas and will stand 100% behind Canada in trying to deal with what is a real problem from which we can't run away. The Estai was released after being held for one week and her crew were able to return home. But Canada had succeeded in expressing its frustration about European predatory activities on its fishing banks. EU er jo, slik som fiskeripolitikken deres er nå, for så vidt en fare for fiskeriressursene. Dette skyldes jo selvfølgelig at EUs fiskeripolitikk er fryktelig vanskelig å utforme. Det er en kamp mellom utallige, knallharde nasjonale politiske realiteter. For eksempel er det ikke lett for spanske myndigheter å ta vekk subsidier fra baskiske fiskere. De fleste vet hvor touchy baskeland-problematikken er i Spania. Og det fører til at spanske politikere er mer opptatt av å holde baskerne på matta enn hvordan det går med torsken. It is rather ironic that, you know, fishermen here for since 1992 have uh, been under moratorium. But fisheries are still taking place out there, um, largely through bycatch, by the way. They're not supposed to be catching cod, but we know, we know from even the statistics that are available is that the bycatch levels are, are considerable and they're high enough to prevent that particular stock from ever recovering. It bothers me certainly that um, that there, uh, you know, there's all uh, continuing to be reports of overfishing and misreporting and all that outside the 200 mile limit. And I think, you know, we we still have to keep working that trying to to bring the other some of the other countries into line <clears throat> and uh, you know stop some of the uh, overfishing and misreporting that happens apparently outside the 200 mile limit. I have a lot of concerns, let's be honest. I, I do have a lot of concerns about the future because uh, I, I, keep, I keep, you know, looking for, uh, for signs that uh, we've changed our ways, that uh, fisheries, fishery management is, is different. I mean, we, st we still keep making mistakes. The hunt for short-term profits tempts many captains into using illegal methods. Pirate fishing is currently one of the greatest threats to fish stocks in northern areas. It appears to be very difficult to stop such fishing activities. On the 15th of October 2005, the Norwegian Coast Guard came across a Russian trawler, the Elektron, which they immediately suspected was engaging in illegal fishing activities. Two Norwegian Coast Guard inspectors were sent on board and found that illegal fishing equipment was being used. When the Coast Guard attempted to make an arrest, the Elektron made a run for it. This is a very serious matter and I order you immediately to change course. Я помню, как Советский Союз защищал свои приоритеты и свое право вот в этом районе. Я помню о том, что какие были границы исторически установившиеся. Поэтому, значит, на основе вот законодательства я считал, что я прав, а норвежцы не правы. Поэтому я и Так вот принял такое решение. With the two inspectors as hostages, the captain tried to enter Russian waters, hotly pursued by a large Norwegian naval force. After three days on the run, the Electron reached Russian waters and the Norwegian Navy was forced to negotiate with the Russian authorities. There you see our inspectors with the nets. You can see 
The Norwegians handed over evidence to the Russian authorities and the Norwegian inspectors were released. Jeg tror det går an å gjøre mange analyser av elektronsaken. Jeg vet ikke om dette var en slags prøvesten eller en, en, en test på hvordan Norge ville reagere fra skal vi si, enkelte krefter i det russiske systemet. Eller om det rett og slett var en fiskeskipper som det, det rabla litt for der og da. Det, det tror jeg ikke vi kommer til å få vite. Saken ble jo løst. Det skal vi være glad for, men jeg tror ikke det er den siste saken hvor, hvor grensesetting og testing og reaksjonsmøster blir utprøvd. Ever since it was first discovered, the Arctic has been exposed to predatory activities. Whales, seals and walruses were much coveted targets for those engaged in whaling and sealing activities. Den valfangsten på Grønlandsval som europeerne startet nord i Barentshavet på slutten av 1600-tallet, var jo det første store overgrepet mot arktis naturressurser. Extensive whaling activities were embarked on in the Arctic after explorers returned with descriptions of the abundant life that existed in the seas there. During the course of just a couple of hundred years, these activities resulted in disastrous consequences. The Spitsbergen stock of the bowhead whales has been calculated to have been between 46 and 48,000 individuals. And over the three centuries of being exploited by commercial whalers, um, some 100,000 individuals have been taken. Bowhead whales were hunted almost to the point of extinction. The oil extracted from these whales was used for lighting purposes in the burgeoning towns of Europe. Da man i løpet av en 100 års tid hadde utryddet um, de bestandene, kom jo en stund senere turen til de andre store valartene, før nordmennene da satte kursen mot Antarktis og banet vei for det virkelig store valblodbadet i Antarktis, som jo mange andre nasjoner raskt ble med på å være en del av. Many people also consider that predatory activities are occurring on the other side of the world, in the Antarctic. A major drive to stop Norwegian and Japanese whaling activities has resulted in conflict. On the 5th of January 2010, this conflict almost ended up with the loss of human life. A Japanese whaling vessel collided with a boat belonging to the environmental organization Sea Shepherd, indicating that the conflict between conservation interests and market forces is likely to intensify in the future. Today, commercial whaling in the Arctic is a thing of the past, but it has left its mark. Perspektivet på den fangsten som har vært tidligere, uh, hvis man seiler opp til Svalbard til, til Amsterdam, ja, der for eksempel, så er det jo, det ligger jo på grunn av at permafrosten tar vare på alt av bein, og det er en liten forhåndelse, så ligger det jo. Det ligger jo så enorme mengder med ben og rester og skjeletter etter den her fangsten. Så det er jo i seg selv en tragisk historie uh, med rovdrift, uh, med enkle midler som virkelig har forandret økologien. Og så vet vi i dag hvor avanserte teknologiske eh, midler som finnes. Altså, det er ikke lett å være fisk i dag når du ser de ekolodene som er ombord på fiskebåtene. Så det er klart at vi har noen, fått noen voldsomme kraftige redskaper til å kunne drive rovdrift. A new world is in the process of being revealed in the ice-covered waters of the Arctic.
The consequences of global warming are more evident here than anywhere else in the world. What used to be safe territory for polar bears is now starting to melt. The ice could disappear completely in the future and polar bears would thus be prevented from migrating from their winter lairs to their hunting grounds. Failure to take global warming seriously could have a detrimental effect on this symbolic image of the Arctic. Isbjørn har blitt et slags symbol på klimaendringene i nordområdene. Men det er jo langt mer dramatiske konsekvenser enn at isbjørnen eventuelt forsvinner, som kommer til å påvirke oss. The environment isn't just being threatened by the melting ice. The arms race between the major powers has also left its mark. Ja, det er ingen tvil om at de, det geopolitiske bildet i Arktis, det sikkerhetspolitiske bildet i Arktis, er gått fra den kalde krigen eh, sitt perspektiv til et ressurs- og miljøperspektiv. Men vi er jo på ingen måte ferdig med den kalde krigen i Arktis. Stocks of environmental poisons and radioactive waste are lying like undetonated bombs and threatening the world's cleanest seas. The cold war can have an enormous problem when it comes to radioactive waste. It applies to both the big buildings that are under the Elven system in Sibir, where there are large amounts of water that are unprecedented and that we fear will be thrown out and run over the Elven system and contaminate the radioactive waste level in the Arctic. The Arctic is the most dangerous part of the Arctic in the Arctic. Det er en belastning vi må ta med oss sammen med de raske temperaturforandringene som reduserer naturens og økologiens befullkapasitet. Klimaendringene sender jo to budskap. Det ene er at se isen smelter. Det fremste varsel på at vi må endre økonomienes utslippskarakter og få utslippene ned. Det er det viktigste. Men budskap to er jo at det åpner seg nye sjøtransportveier. Det kan gå nordvestpassasje, nordøstpassasje eller rett over Nordpolen. During the summer of 2009, Beluga shipping from Germany sailed successfully through the Northeast Passage. This trip indicates that there could be a substantial increase in shipping in the area. Det er en symbolreise som viser at det er mulig. Og det er en symbolreise for fremtiden. Noe er i ferd med å skje. But if the Arctic Ocean was open during the summer months, this would considerably reduce the time it would take to transport goods by sea between Europe and Asia. For example, a hypothetical route between the ports of Rotterdam in the Netherlands and Yokohama in Japan would be 40% shorter than the present route through the Suez Canal. This is attracting the interest of the major powers. For det første så vet vi allerede at det fraktes olje og gass ut fra Nordvest-Russland. Dette er strategiske ressurser som de ønsker transportert til sine egne markeder og til verdensmarkeder. Jeg er ikke noe i tvil om at olje- og gasstransporter kommer til å øke i årene fremover. Many people are highly critical of such increased activities. An accident in these areas could result in serious consequences for fish stocks and other forms of animal life. Dette er et sted hvor store pattedyr beiter, isbjørn, hval, og som er grunnlaget for de rike fiskeriene som vi har i særdeleshet i Barentshavet. 
Hvis man får et oljespill i et område av denne typen, så ville man kunne redusere grunnlaget for de fiskeriene man har der på en dramatisk måte. Basically what's happening now outside OPEC is that the decline of traditional crude oil like in the North Sea or in in the in Mexico in Russia production is is declining and in some cases very very steeply and we see oil companies developing new resources like tar sands in Canada like heavy uh, heavy crude deep oil resources in Brazil and Arctic oil is certainly a new area of research that is quite fascinating because it's one of the rare areas in a world that has not, never been drilled so far uh, because uh, it was te technically speaking too difficult to have access to these resources and it's becoming now uh, uh, something that looks possible. Uh, but of course there are many, many problems to be solved uh, before having access to these resources. Utviklingen og utnyttelsen av ressursene, eh, den skal være så begrenset at om det skulle skje en ulykke, så vil, eh, vil den ha begrenset lokal eh, betydning. Men hvis man ser dette i lys av de signalene stormaktene kommer med eh, i, i for det arktiske området, så er det helt åpenbart, slik jeg ser det og fortolker det, at uh, stormaktene vil ha uh, disse ressursene i de kvanta de trenger, og de trenger store kvanta. There's currently an escalation in the conflict between the environment and oil production in the Arctic. Vi tror jo at Arktis har et, et stort potensiale, men det må da avdekkes nå gjennom industriell virksomhet og letevirksomhet i de områdene, både i Alaska, utenfor Grønland, i Barentshavet, i Norge på russisk side, og selvfølgelig også videre, videre østover. Vi vet at hele dette området her eh, har, eh, har noe av verdens reneste mat i dag. Eh, høy kvalitet, godt betalt, kan fø mange mennesker. Eh, det er klart, dette kan vi ikke sjanse på. Faren for en oljevirke, den kan man alltid diskutere matematisk hvor stor den er. Men ingen kan bestride av at vi ikke vi har teknologi, utstyr eller kompetanse til å rydde opp eller avklare de effektene i, i disse kalde og brutale områdene. Spøkesøtskipet som ligger nesten helt under vann, klistret opp til klippene på søtspisen av Shetland. Strekker seg nå 60 kilometer nordover langt kysten av Shetland. Vi har sett hvordan disse skipene kan havarere. Det faktum at så mange aktører flytter in i dette området. Det inviteres sågar til sektorkonflikter. Og vi har sett det nå i, i Lofoten Vesterålen, hvor, hvor det er lovende strukturer for olje og gass i områder som er oppvekstområder for fisk. Og vi ser hvordan fiskerinæringen og miljøinteressene på den ene siden står mot, mot olje- og gassindustrien. The cod in the Barents Sea are completely dependent on Lofoten and Vesterålen where they spawn. The same applies to herring, which is one of the most important sources of food for cod. Row and lava float with the current into the Barents Sea where they grow and form the basis of one of the world's most abundant fisheries. Och visst du tar vikten av de äggarna som ligger alltså en meters tyckelse på bond var vår så veier de syv ganger mer enn, enn Norges befolkning på 4,5 millioner mennesker. Så det er en stor biologisk masse. Dette er jo et av de fem viktigste områdene for marin fiskeproduksjon i verden. Den type oljesøl akkurat i drivbanen til sillinger, som er veldig sårbar for den type forurensning, og som er en så viktig del av næringsgrunnlaget, 
for, for torsken videre kan få dramatiske konsekvenser. Det er viktig for oss at vi opprettholder aktiviteten på norsk sokkel, fortsetter teknologiutviklingen og kompetanseutviklingen i norsk olje- og gassnæring, så er det viktig at vi får tilgang til nye områder, og dette er det mest interessante for oss. Det å ta vare på torsken versus å ikke ta vare på den, er på en måte skillekriteriet på om vi slår inn på riktig vei, eller om vi fortsetter på gal vei. Advanced trawlers, global oil companies and giant supertankers are all heading north. The race has started in earnest. Predatory activities of the past have created a lasting impression. Our knowledge is better this time, but will we look after this vulnerable area or will the melting ice in the Arctic pave the way for new predatory activities with unexpected consequences? Nord vi nå har startet det endelige kappløpet inn i et, etter hvert, isfritt Arktis, så er det jo viktig å ha vår egen historie i bakhodet. Vil vi gjenta de feil med utrydelse, med uholdbar forvaltning av ressurser? Eventually we're going to have to live without oil, because it's a finite resource. We cannot live without food, and fish is probably the best human food available on the planet, certainly the best protein source available. Fish is a renewable resource. It's absolutely necessary to feeding the world population. Looking to the future, there's, uh, there's a lot of challenges. It's like uh, trying to turn around a big super tanker or something. It's, you know, the, the momentum is there, you know, to do things the way we've always done things, but uh, uh, we need to, uh, to figure out ways to do things differently. I keep hoping that we, that we are able to learn from, uh, from the mistakes of, of the past. Why would you develop a strategy which would, which would for very little extra gain, risk, because you don't know the outcome, there's no guarantees, but risk devastating some of the major fish stocks of the world. Why would you do that? There are many stories in Arktis from William Barnes came up there first time to what we have done with fishery on Newfoundland to other stories about how we are able to save a lot with a simple method. When we see what we have of technology and resources, whether it's the use of technology or the use of oil or the use of oil or the use of oil, we have to be extremely careful. Because this is a ecosystem that has been set under great pressure for the next few years, and this is 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 the next few years. Jeg er optimist og tror jo at vi mennesker skal klare å forvalte dette, men det krever klokskap og aktsomhet av våre politiske ledere.